Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm really delighted to be part of this uh, distinguished conference. So I've, la over the last four days, I've been to Boston, LA, and now Oslo. So please forgive me if um, my, my thinking's a little slow. Uh, but today, I'm going to be talking about the Belt and Road, Belt and Road Initiative and, and China's new economic statecraft. So in the first half, I'm going to talk about the BRI in the context of China's uh, broader foreign policy trajectory and economic statecraft. And, I'll, and, I'll, and then I'll turn to examining the uh, outcomes of the BRI so far. So as I'm sure many of you know, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is an ambitious plan that was announced by the Chinese government in 2013, uh, which envisioned spending at least 1.3 trillion US dollars uh, in investment projects across a wide swath of countries. So not just in developing regions in Southeast Asia and Africa or Central Asia, but also stretching um, to Europe. And over the last few years, it's really expanded into an amorphous and tenuously defined initiative, partly as a result of the different multiple um, actors and interests uh, involved within China, uh, whereby virtually any overseas investment project um, done by a Chinese firm is now seen as part or framed as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And this includes um, rhetoric as well um, by, by foreign observers. And so there are different interpretations of the goals of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, some of it is economic, where the Chinese government is seeking to solve overcapacity problems in the domestic economy uh, by exporting capital and, and labor overseas. And, uh, and of course, that's the geopolitical and security uh, motivations as well, where the Belt and Road Initiative is seen as part of China's strategy a uh, grand strategy, perhaps, to gain, uh, gain greater global uh, political influence. And so this feeds into a debate over what the Belt and Road Initiative means for, um, you know, what, what it means as well as uh, what are the implications for global order and China's role as a rising power. And this debate is now occurring as well in the context um, of growing attention to the potential of weaponized interdependence in which globalization has not only fostered greater linkages and connectivity and interdependence uh, across countries, but also perhaps opened up a new realm of uh, geopolitical competition through economic tools and opportunities for dominant powers to use um, their dominant uh, relationships in these net uh, economic networks uh, to manipulate economic relations for geopolitical purposes. And the sense the BRI can be seen as part of uh, China's economic statecraft, where there's renewed effort, effort to use uh, China's growing economic clout uh, in terms of trade, investment, and aid uh, to pursue its geopolitical objectives and you know, buy over countries um, or entice governments, of course, them to, to fall in line with the China, Chinese government's preferences. Um, here, I also just want to take a step back to situate the Belt and Road Initiative in the context uh, of China's trajectory of economic diplomacy. Uh, so the, the title of my, of my remarks was supposed to be about China's new economic statecraft, but I also do want to add that you know, economic statecraft is not a new aspect of China's foreign policy toolkit. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, Beijing actively offered aid to entice countries away from the Soviet Union's orbit. And um, before Xi Jinping and since the 2000s, um, China has also actively used economic inducements to peel away uh, Taiwan's diplomatic allies. Uh, and the more, on a more coercive front, also uh, used uh, economic sanctions, retaliations uh, against countries uh, who, who have gone against Chinese government's uh, positions on territorial disputes in the South China Sea, uh, who are leaders who have um, had the Dalai Lama visit. Um, and also in some cases over the awarding of uh, a Nobel Peace Prize. And so, so I think economic diplomacy has become more prominent for China, uh, especially since the 2000s, uh, with the expansion of its overseas uh, investments uh, and trade with other countries. And I think the trends have further accelerated since the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis, and certainly under current President Xi Jinping. Whereby, and so, so you see, we have, in the past, we had this growing, going out strategy where Chinese firms were encouraged to invest overseas. And all this has now been repackaged as part of the sweeping Belt and Road Initiative. And the BRI also has its roots uh, in the March West strategy uh, that was originally articula articulated by um, an influential scholar at uh, Peking University, Wang Cixi. Uh, who advocated for China to focus on its relations with uh, and foreign policy engagement with Central Asia and the Middle East 
in order to minimize zero sum tensions with the United States and East Asia. But as you can see, the BRI has now expanded into a very far reaching and argu arguably more provocative uh, global initiative. And so this has produced uh, diverging and heterogeneous responses. There are some who fear that increasing economic dependence on China provides new sources of uh, coercive leverage uh, for the Chinese government. Uh, but there are many countries that uh, who also remain eager to attract Chinese investment and Chinese financing. So we see a lot of countries continuing to sign up for the BRI. And certainly the United States is uh, concerned about losing out to China as well on a competition for global economic and political influence. But I, th I would say the underlying one of these concerns is the assumption that China's uh, overseas economic presence will automatically translate into actual geopolitical clout and geopolitical influence for the Chinese government. And so this raises an important question as to the effectiveness of China's economic statecraft. And so what have been the outcomes of the BRI so far and what have been the outcomes of China's economic statecraft? So in my research, I find that China so far has tended to use a strategy of what I call subversive carrots, uh, which involves often the use of corruption, bribes and kick offering bribes and kickbacks to government officials, um, and implementing projects, investment projects, or, uh, that, that essentially circumvent the regulatory and institutional procedures in many of these recipient countries. And so this has certainly worked at times. Uh, we see Cambodia, a uh, major recipient of Chinese aid and investment, um, actively uh, blocking regional efforts in Southeast Asia to implement a multilateral consensus or a multilateral uh, effort uh, to respond to Chinese behavior in the South China Sea. And uh, more recently, uh, in, uh, with regard to the Xinjiang issue, we see Muslim countries also becoming more reticent in criticizing uh, the human rights abuses. For example, Turkey, which used to be uh, more critical um, after receiving an uh, aid investment package in China, uh, now has been uh, very silent on, on the Xinjiang issue. But I do want to emphasize that the use of subversive carrots has also generated significant uh, political and public backlash uh, in several countries, including important ones on China's Belt and Road. And we see incumbent politicians losing office in the last couple of years in Malaysia, in the Maldives, uh, and in Sri Lanka for taking corrupt infrastructure loans uh, linked to the Chinese government and Chinese firms. And so this is important because it means that we see resistance to the Belt and Road initi Initiative uh, in a range of developing countries, even those with uh, perhaps uh, imperfect uh, or flawed democratic processes. And so this suggests a certain level of resilience uh, to Chinese efforts to buy political influence. And this backlash has also produced a demonstration effect where you see um, the creation of a negative reputation for China's BRI overall. And so while China has, might have been able to buy over a small number of countries in uh, specific situations, I would argue that Beijing has not been broadly successful in actually gaining goodwill uh, and sustained political influence globally through the Belt and Road Initiative. However, I do want to note that China is also learning um, and suggesting a strategy of economic statecraft. Uh, my conversations in China, we see uh, I have, uh, that my interlocutors increasingly, increasingly acknowledge um, the need for better public diplomacy, uh, cooperation, and improved governance standards for Chinese overseas investments. And so we're seeing this shift uh, slowly, uh, rhetorically, as well as in practice. So first, rhetorically, we've seen a rebranding of the Belt and Road Initiative. In recent years, Beijing has announced efforts to curb corruption, uh, not just domestically, but also abroad and increased monitoring of overseas investments. And in the most recent Belt and Road Forum in April 2019, uh, we also see Chinese leaders going beyond the usual rhetoric um, of win-win to really emphasize mantras of having quality infrastructure, emphasizing debt sustainability, uh, improved governance and transparency. And so we see how international pressure and backlash from developed and developing countries has pushed Beijing to, at least rhetorically, move towards improving and promoting improved uh, institutional standards uh, through the BRI. And also in practice, in the context of certain bilateral relationships, uh, we also see the Chinese government being pressured to alter the uh, nature of the economic inducements that are being offered. Uh, recently in Malaysia is one example where uh, the uh, major railway project, the East Coast Rail Link, was suspended um, because of its link to um, corruption under the previous prime minister. Uh, the, new uh, the new government, after coming to power, 
uh, actively rene renegotiated the project with China to lower the costs and improve the terms and benefits uh, for Malaysia. And in Myanmar cases, well, the Myanmar government, with the help of the U.S. State Department, has also renegotiated um, a deport port contract um, with China. And so we see uh, pushback uh, against the, the type of Chinese investment projects they are being offered. And so what are the implications of this, given these mixed results of the BRI so far? I think it's important that we should not buy into the narrative of China's expanding global uh, you know, and unrivaled dominance. I think we see a much more mixed picture. It's much less easy to buy political influence across a broad range of countries. Uh, there's been considerable backlash and resilience. And if China is trying to use the BRI as part of its grand strategy, it hasn't been that effective so far. And in terms of U.S. response to the Belt and Road Initiative, I think that zero-sum framing or rhetoric is, um, as, choosing, you know, as having to choose between the United States and China is certainly not that productive, especially as Washington hasn't been uh, active in providing credible alternatives. Because many countries, uh, the immediate benefits of economic inducements often outweigh the potential future costs of coercive leverage. And given the diff difficulties in being a peer competitor um, to Chinese financing, I think a multilateral effort would be more effective and should be more emphasized. Uh, one important approach would be to um, improve uh, and expand alternative sources of financing uh, between the U.S. and its port like-minded partners in Europe and elsewhere, uh, with Australia and Japan, for example, and also working through multilateral institutions. Perhaps if we could reform and streamline lending processes in these multilateral institutions uh, to make these alternative sources more appealing and more effective, I think this could address concerns in many recipient countries who often point out that uh, the attraction of Chinese financing often lies in the speed of uh, how, the money, uh, how the money is given. In addition, uh, I would suggest that we pay more attention to, to strengthening account accountability institutions and mechanisms of transparency and oversight uh, in BRI recipient countries. If um, the U.S. and, and uh, European countries you know, more actively share know-how and technical expertise and resources uh, through to these developing countries, it could be a pretty cost-effective way of enabling these countries to have greater capacity uh, and know-how to respond and manage uh, China's rise. Finally, I just want to conclude uh, with the thought, and, you know, this has been brought up in the previous presentation and as well as in other panels today, we're seeing incre increasing prominence of uh, economic tools in national security policy and geopolitical competition. And so I think there's a really a need for more comprehensive and strategic uh, government responses uh, and coordination across national security and economic uh, bureaucracies and greater thinking and debate in the academic realm as well as in policy community about the security externalities of economic activity, uh, whether it be economic inducements or economic uh, coercion. And with that, I look forward to the discussion uh, in a little bit. Thank you.